So, hello to everyone. I'm Davide Giordano. I'm a community manager in Torino for a Google Developer Group. Google Developer Groups are a community of people interested in technology, and especially Google technology, but not only. We gather together like uh, twice a month or even more. Now, for example, we're organizing uh, in, this, in this exact time another event, a study jam on uh, Android for beginners in a room here in Politecnico. And uh, this, uh, our purpose is to uh, meet together exactly, to uh, exchange some knowledge like uh, with talks, like the one that Roberto is going to uh, held uh, right now. And uh, of course, uh, do networking, uh, exchange maybe projects, uh, etc. I'm not the only one in the community of Google Developer Group. Uh, there are other guys. Uh, there are actually, for example, one is doing uh, the, the study jam lecture in the other room. And uh, we are hoping, so what does it mean? That uh, a community is something that everyone can join, okay? So if you have an idea, if you want to share something, just uh, feel free to send us an email, contact us, uh, and uh, we will be glad to maybe schedule an event together, like uh, today, and uh, launch something new. A couple of words about Trendroid. Trendroid is our uh, new project. It's something completely new uh, that was developed thanks to an idea of uh, Alessia, that is our colleagues working on the marketing and communication. Trendroid uh, is a series of events, a roadshow, that uh, has the goal to give you the, all the tools to build a perfect Android application. Uh, so we, in Trendroid, uh, we deal with very advanced uh, programming techniques, uh, frameworks, uh, APIs, and softwares that will be an extra for your application, uh, for your mobile application. And uh, this is the first meeting that we are doing for Android. We will hold uh, other meetings in the next months and weeks. And uh, in the last meeting, which will be the fifth one, it's going to be a daily meeting. So we start at like 10 a.m. and then at 7 p.m. So there will be plenty of talks and panels, etc. So I'm glad also to again repeat the, uh, my message. So if you're interested in maybe sharing some knowledge, uh, there's a call for papers open. So just write us an email. And so that's it. Thank you for your attention. And I'll give the microphone to Roberto for uh, 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 his talk. Thank you. OK, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining. OK, today we're going to talk about RX Android. OK, I'll sit down because, uh, well, I'm tired, I'm, I'm old, a lot of stuff. So uh, just a quick introduction about me. That is not the minimum SDK version that I support, I swear. I don't do that, but it's, well, the first time I've ever seen Android in my life. That is quite a long time ago. So now I'm uh, in a company called Nova here in Turin, and here are a bunch of links where you can find me. So let's introduce um, the first steps for starting with Rx Android. OK, the first thing that we need to know is that Rx Android is based on the idea of a very specific design pattern, that is the observer pattern. But first, what is a design pattern? The design pattern is a solution that we already know to a problem that we usually find. That means that every time we encounter the same issue, we are able to solve it in the same way. So we are not reinventing the wheel every time. That is fairly amazing. And there are a couple of books that are pretty nice on the subject. The first one is this one, that is like, uh, I don't know if you studied C, it's like the kerning and enrich for the design pattern. So it's like a Bible that you, sh you should have in your bookshelf, like always. But since we actually are Java developers, we need something that is written for Java developers. That is this one. OK? So this one is pretty good. And it has also a very, very nice graphic. So if you want to check it out, feel free, because it's very good. So we were talking about the observer pattern. Where is it? Oh, yeah, there. OK. The observer pattern works more or less like the listener pattern on Android. So how many of you are familiar with the listener pat partner, uh, well, uh, pattern on Android? Raise your hands. Yeah, I know you know it. I know you know it as well. So nobody knows the listeners. Come on, guys. OK, so the listener um, 
is more or less like the observer. That means that our view, for instance, uh, let's think about a button, can notify us of its triggering state. I mean, when we press the button, we know that the button has been pressed, okay? The observer is more or less like that. But instead of just one listener, you can have as many as you want. So you can have a full list of, of observers that connect to the same observable and are notified or any, of, any, of any change in this observable. Okay? So we already know it, as we know many other patterns that are already in our everyday life. For instance, there is another pattern that is well, pretty difficult to use otherwise, that is the flyweight pattern. That is more or less the view holder or of the recycler view. I don't know, many of you used the, the, the list view before. There was always the, the, discu the discussion about, yeah, shall I use it or shall I not use it? Well, we shall. So those are all design patterns that we find every day. We may call it view holder or flyweight, listener or observable, but it's always the same. It's a common solution to a problem that we usually have. So, uh, another thing that is very, very important when we start using um, Rx Java or Rx, ja or Rx Android is the concept of immutability. That means that once we create an object, we are not going to change it. Because if we change it, well, it's not good because of what we actually see next. That is the functional programming. Oh, well, I might step back. Back, not forward. Yeah, step back. OK, that's it. So this comes directly from the maths world, where if we apply the same function to the same data, we shall always have the same result. So this is why we need immutability, because if we can change our object inside our function, then the next time we apply the function to that object, well, we won't have the same result. So that wouldn't really last for us. I mean, we need something that can help us in generating something that is constant. So if I apply the same function to one and I get two, I cannot change that one anymore. I mean, shall always be one. So this is why those two concepts are really tied together. And the next, and this is the last part of the introduction as well, are the reactive extension. Yeah, OK. So the first line will come for last. I don't know why I put it there, but I mean, yeah, should be behind, but well. OK, so reactive is not born with Java. It was at least three years older before it came uh, to Java, and it was developed for .NET framework. So we actually copied something that was already available for C Sharp developers. And it has been ported to the, to the Java virtual machine, not only Java, because the engineer at Netflix needed something that was more scalable than their current uh, architecture. So they were like, yeah, why don't we just, you know, invent a new framework? And they did. So they took the concept from Rx and tried to port them to Java, but not only Java, but to all the languages that actually supports the Java virtual machine. That means also Scala, now also Kotlin. That actually is fairly nice, but I mean. And then after a while, we also needed an Android. But uh, well, Eric's Java was meant to be <coughs> for normal Java. And we have a few components that, well, lacks in the Java distribution. So we needed some bindings. For instance, something that could run our code on the Android main thread. Otherwise, we couldn't be able to actually change the views or something that could transform our views in something that we, can, that we can observe. Because, OK, the listener is an observer. But well, you know that if you declare two different data types, if, even if they are the same, well, Java would most probably just say, hey, what are you doing? I'm expecting the other one. Unless you extend it, no way I can understand. So we needed something that could bring Rx Java to Android. That is, is how Rx Android was born. Before it was .NET, then Netflix ported to the Java Virtual Machine, and then few people 
helped with the Android uh, version. Okay, now for the first point, that is push against pull. Okay, let's imagine how the pull work. We all tried to actually uh, enumerate all the items in an array. Okay, what we do is actually uh, observing the structure and say, yeah, I want this one, I want this one, I want this one. So we actually pull it from the data structure. With RxJava, it's the opposite. It's the data structure that is pushing out, pushing out all the values that we can observe. So we are inverting the principle. Instead of having something that takes the values out of the structure, it's the structure itself that say, yeah, you can have this, and now this, and now this. So it's the exact, the exact opposite. Everything is clear till here? Yeah, okay. So if you didn't uh, download the project yet, you can do that now because we're gonna need it. So feel free to connect and download the project. So let's get started with Eric's Android. So these are the five key points of the framework. And we're gonna start with the observables. Observables are actually the main part of, the, of our routine. That means that is something that generates the values that we can observe then. But hey, I forgot, I didn't say why shall we use RxJava. I mean, okay, everyone is using it, but it's not the only reason. RxJava is extremely good when we want to do something that is multi-thread. We don't need thread pool executor or using a sync task. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't want to mention that thing. Or even loaders that are even more painful to use because of their APIs that are not really easy to implement. Or services that are always hard to deal with because you never know when to tear down, when they're actually alive, when the system kill them. So we need, we need something that is more flexible and simpler to use. With RxJava, we, we will see that it's just a matter of two lines to define where we want to run our code and where we want the result. Imagine how long would it take to instantiate a service and getting back all the results in the main thread. It's not two lines. I mean, it will be at least 20 or 30. For everything we're going to do, we just need that code. Moreover, we can see the data as a, as a flux of data. It's not anymore a simple object, but we have a stream that we can change and we can react to every event. So it's nothing like uh, um, something that we are really used to, like uh, a single event. It's a stream and we react to that stream. Also, we can use it for network request or even for handling the uh, rotation of the changing of the state in Android. That are all pain points when it comes to Android development. So Eric's Java is not a silver bullet, because it's not, but it will help us in every situation once we master it. It's not like those games that are, yeah, easy to play, hard to master. This is hard to understand, this is hard to explain, and this is hard to use. But in the long run, it will help you a lot. At the point that every time you see a situation in which you could use Rx Java, it will be your first solution. And you will, you will do that because that is the, the main strength <coughs> of Rx Java. The fact that it is really, really helpful, even if at the beginning is hard to manage. So we were talking about observables. Okay. So uh, we, we saw that we need to create the observables, or at least we need something that gives us the data. Okay? The observable on its own uh, well, is just a simple object, uh, and we can create it in this way. It's just a method. Okay? It takes this observable unsubscribe object, and it will call the call method. We don't know anything more at the moment, okay? But actually, it's not really interesting at this point 
because we don't know how to use it. So it's not the absurd, this method here that is interesting, but actually this object here. Because this object here has got the three methods that are the on next, the on completed, and the on error, that are those that start our routine. So I try to explain it because it's not that easy. Our observable are two kinds of observable. This one that we are seeing here is called cold, like cold, because it needs this object here to start listening before it can start its logic. So this observable will just, at this point, say to the subscriber that this string, normal hello world, is the one that it needs to process. Okay, this, this one is very, very, very basic, of course. But what is happening is what we were uh, saying a few minutes ago. That means our object, our data structure, is the one that is saying, yeah, I can give you this object, and you can do whatever you want with that. So what are we doing here is simply saying, yeah, you can have this data. I don't have anything else. And that's it. So when we call the next, we are actually passing our data to the subscriber. That is the one that will process it in some way. We don't know how, we don't know why, we just pass the data. But well, if we just call the next, uh, we have a very long sequence. Uh, maybe the subscriber never knows when he can shut, shut down. And that's why we have the uncompleted method and also the error. Because for being uh, conform to the to the guidelines, uh, we need to call at least, uh, well, not really at least, we need to call a number that we want from zero to infinite of on next, uh, and at least one between on completed and on error. Those are the two <coughs> items that will actually terminate our sequence. Okay, so um, actually we will never use the create, but we will see in a moment that, because we need to, uh, to understand what is this hot and cold. We talked about the cold, that is the fact that we need someone that is listening to us before we start talking. Uh, the hot is the opposite. We don't need anyone listening to us. We can just start talking and whoever arrives in the room can listen from where we, uh, we are. So it's the, uh, it's, a little different. I mean, for this, I wait for you all to come and sit down, and then I can I start talking. If I'm not observable, I don't mind. I arrive here, and I start talking. If I'm alone, it doesn't really matter. So, it's a well, it's the opposite. So, oh yeah, again this one. So. Ah, now I recall. This, are, this is because now we saw how to create an observable and you have 10 minutes to try in the project to create one. You will have different methods to create, a, to create an observable, but actually the one that you shall use is this one. We will see the others in 10 minutes, but please start and try to create an observable in the project. You shall find a class, a class that is called playground and you can create the observable there. Uh, it's well, pretty, pretty much this code here. You can create any kind of observable you want as this one are actually generics. So if you don't want to emit a string but you want to emit a boolean with the, with the high B because otherwise it won't work, you can do that. And if you want to create an integer, you can do that. Just try for the next 10 minutes and see what happens. Try to run your code and try to see if actually something happens. Or, okay, we also have the solution for this and this is in the step one branch. So feel free to check that. Because time's up and we need to go a little further to the definition of function and actions. Okay, so 
uh, we talked about functional programming, but we didn't really see functions right now. So uh, Java 7 is not a functional programming language, pure objects. So also function and actions are actually objects with one method that is the one that we call with different parameters to do the job that we need to do. The difference between function and actions is actually the same that, it, that comes uh, between function and procedures. So does returns a value, does do not. So we have different implementation of functions and actions in the framework, all taking generics because we, mm, well, we need functions that can take one, two, three, four, five, six different parameters. In Java, we don't have a way to do that without generics. So we have, for instance, func1, func2, func3, and as far as I know, they ended up there. And so, I mean, with the func3, we have four different generics because we don't know what can come in and what can come out. So we need that. For actions, it's actually much better because we also have action zero. That are those that do not take any parameter and just are void. We will see that those are pretty much used when it comes to elaborate the input that we have. And we'll see it here in the subscribers. So we saw earlier about the subscriber that are those that actually make our observable start the mission. So uh, how do we actually uh, create a subscriber? Spoiler alert, well, we are not, well, we were doing that already earlier. And here we find this method here. Why that? That is because, well, uh, this is a lowercase o, by the way. Because, uh, yeah, we told our observable what to do when the subscriber arrives. Uh, well, this is what the subscriber shall do. Because we told our observable how to push the data, but we didn't know what to do here. I mean, any one of you knew what we were doing when we passed the hello world string? I wasn't, because we really, we didn't create that part yet. And this is how we do it. So, for creating the subscriber, we, are, we have actually this class here. This is just an anonymous class that I was using here for, for making it more readable. Uh, but the subscriber is an object defined by these three methods, okay? So, as we were saying earlier, these are the three methods that can, cannot be avoided if we want to stay compliant to the standard. And that's it. Here, we know that everything went as we wanted, so we can close everything. Here, uh, well, something bad happened, so maybe we can manage it there. And here is when we do our logic most of the times. Most of the times we want you won't use this, but you will just use the two of, of them because you want to know the data that you're processing and if anything else, well, failed miserably. But this is not the only way to create a subscriber. This is a better way. I mean, this is faster and this is where we have our actions. So if you are emitting a string, like we were earlier, then we create the on next. That is this method here. You see, an action one that takes the same generics that we had here. So this is our on next. Uh, here, the throwable is our on error. And here, the action zero that don't take any parameter is our on complete. So the only um, mandatory parameter here is the on next. You could do anything like that, and it will work. But there is an issue with that, because if you don't define a callback for the exception, one 
of the point that we did the mention about Rx Java, uh, well, won't be used because the exception will just be thrown to the system and your application will crash. So another very interesting feature of Rx Java is the fact that you can manage the exception at any level of your chain. That means that if your subscriber can manage the exception, you won't need the try catch. You will have the exception there and you know that you will stay there. But if you don't put this one here, uh, well, it doesn't know how to handle it. So we'll just forward it to the system. So we saw how to create an observable, that is with the create, fa create factory method. And we saw that with that method, we can decide what type of data we can send to the subscriber. And with that, we created the observable. Now we need to make it start. To make it start, we need to subscribe to it. Without a subscription, the observable won't run. At least this, kind, this type of observable won't run no matter how. No matter how hard you try, it won't. So you need a subscriber. Okay? So, now we saw how to create an observable and how to create a subscriber. So, now you have the two classes. I would like you all to create an observable in the subscriber that emits one string that is a low word and we'll print it to the log, okay? So you have 10 minutes to do it, so have fun, it's funny. So let me know if any trouble arises, yeah. What kind of problem should we had before because there is no any problem when we use the previous method? But if you saw, your string was just lost. You didn't actually see any return. You had something stay there, but it didn't really start. No exception. No, no exception. You were just emitting a string. If you want to try, try to, instead of calling the subscriber.onCompleted after your next, try to call the onError. And try to avoid using this one. For calling the onError, you will need a trouble. Um, trouble. So maybe uh, use something that will make uh, your application crash, like, I don't know, network on main thread exception. It's always good. Or, I don't know, any other kind of bad exception that you can have. Subscriber object is the observable class, right? Uh, nope. The subscriber is actually subscriber. The observable is the one that emits the value. So uh, actually the subscriber in, a, in the design pattern is called the observer because it's, it's one that observes. But since, uh, well, actually calling observable.observe uh, could have been, you know, a little bit tedious, they, try, they actually used a subscribe method because this method here, uh, we used here like a void, but it's not a void. It will return a subscription. A subscription um, is the link between the chain that you are creating and your um, the life cycle of your activity. Let's put it in this way. So the subscription uh, will help you, uh, for instance, dismiss all the action when your activity closes. Because if you do not, and you have, for instance, uh, a sequence uh, that runs every second, you will keep everything alive because nobody told this guy here to unsubscribe. So for the moment, we are using it uh, like a void because we are just uh, emitting a string. But we see later that actually this is not the correct way. Okay. What we actually, um, what I did not highlight earlier is that here we have an observable and earlier we create an observable. So we could actually just chain this subscribe to the create one, okay? Because this is another superpower over X Java. These are uh, actually everything is an operator. What that means? Operators are object that can help us in manipulate our data, okay? Imagine the builder paradigm, okay? Everyone tried to use an, an alert dialog before, yeah? 
Yeah, I know you do. So I know you did. So how many of you already saw an alert dialog here? Yeah, you, you, you. Okay, so uh, we saw that we can chain all the calls to the builder so that we have a very nice series of lines that describes our alert dialog, right? The, issues, the issue with that is that everything is concurring in creating a single object. In Alex Java, we can do pretty much the same. Uh, I mean, we can chain everything, but uh, actually we are doing something different because every operator, every call we make is actually working only on the immutable result emitted by the operator before him in the chain. That means that if we call the set title, for instance, uh, we are changing something in the dialog. But if we call another operator, that, let's call it map, we are generating another value that we pass to the other operator down in the chain. That operator will work only on the input that he receives and will emit something else. But it won't concur to create something that is behind. It will just work on that specific item. So we have different type of operators. Uh, we have all those categories and we actually saw this one earlier. Uh, but, uh, well, it wasn't the only one to create observables. We can create them in a plethora of ways. I mean, this one is the hardest to master because we cannot manage anything from there. We can just say, yeah, emit that value. But if we want to emit a single value, like the string, we can use this one. Just, we create an observable that will emit one values and then will complete. So it will do exactly what we were trying to do earlier, but, well, with just one method. So if you try now to type observable.just and put a string, it will be exactly the same that using create and trying to call the unnext and the uncompleted on the subscriber. But, well, uh, we usually don't have just one value, but we can have maybe this one. Vectors. We can use arrays, lists, or any kind of enumerable data. We can use this one, because it will do all the work for us. It will emit every item one at a time. So we won't need any for cycle, any while, any do while, anything. It will do everything for us. So we already saw that we have the create, the just, the from, and then we have the defer, that is actually pretty advanced, and it will actually postpone the execution of our, of our observable until we say him to really start. So it doesn't matter if we subscribe now, but it will wait until we say to him, yeah, you can start. So it, will, it won't wait just for the subscriber, but also for a start command. Okay, more or less like that. It's a pretty much different, but, well, it's more or less that. Uh, the interval and the range and the timer are those that actually are, uh, well, are nice to know, but you won't use them that much. I mean, the timer one is the one that we start after a timer that we set. The range will emit all the items that we have in a range. It means uh, we can say, yeah, emit 100 items. So we say, yeah, go from one to, to 100 and it will do. No, we don't need to declare any vector. And the interval, we instead rerun at a specific interval. So instead of a timer, we will have an interval. So it will do the emission every 20 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds or whatever we, we ask him to do. But those are just to create observ the observables. And so far, we didn't see something that was really helpful, did we? So, I mean, we just created something and displayed it. This is not where the true power of Eric's Java actually comes handy. And we will see in the next category. That is the transformational one. So. Eric's Java is an operator for almost everything you want to do. And those are just three that comes with the transformational category. 
you have at least 10 more. And what they do is actually transform what we create in something different. This one is one of the most important because it will take the observable that we have, for instance, an observable of string, and it will create another observable of another, uh, of another kind. So we can create from an observable of string an observable of Boolean, for instance. Okay? It will actually create an observable of, of observable of Boolean, and then it will flat down to an, to an observable. Because I mean, observing an observable that is an observable, so it will be a mess. So this one can transform an observable in another observable. Okay? This one actually take the item that we emitted, so the string, and will transform to something else. So instead of transforming the observable itself, it will transform the value of the observable. So if we emitted hello world, we can have something that is, for instance, the length of the string. And this will do for us. And then there is the group by that is more or less like the S SQL group by. But, uh, well, we saw them that are actually, uh, well, methods that don't take any parameter. It's not like that. They take a function, okay? That means that the function that we uh, specify earlier are what goes in there, there, and there. We need functions to define what we want to do because the map operator can do this. He doesn't know what we really want to do. so. We need a function that takes, for instance, a string and returns a boolean or an integer. So we will put our code in the function that lies here. So we saw the use for the action in the subscriber and the function for the operators. This is the core of Rx Java. Functions, operators, and actions. Everything can be chained in any way, and you will just observe the final result. So here we saw how to transform observable values and how to group them. But so far, well, we could do that in Java easily. I mean, nothing fairly new. Uh, but well, we have something else. This is the filter category. So, uh, well, we have those four operators. Actually, we have way more in that part. And imagine that we want, uh, for instance, to parse a very long text, okay? And we want to find all the occurrences of the word off. Okay, imagine how much code would you need to write for that to work. It will be massive. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Imagine doing that with a very, very long test. So you also need to actually make it run on another thread, for instance, and return the, uh, the result on the main thread, because you want to display just a number in the text view. It will take a while. If the text is very, very long, you cannot do that right away. You need something. So m most of these items of these operators run on their own thread. So we don't need to worry about that, because they do the job for us. So this one, for instance, will just let through all the items that match a condition. So for instance, we can use this idea of the regular expression to just say, hey, yeah, you match these, you can go. Or um, we can just say, yeah, I want the first item that comes in, no matter if the regular expression is matched or not. I just want the first one. Or we can just say, yeah, I want only the first one that matches our regular expression, because we couldn't write the regular expression that filter only the first one. So we found on the web a one that matches everything, and we want to use that. Or we can take the first n items that matches that part, or only the first n items, and we will use this. Or and this is one of the most useful operators that you can find, that the bounce one. That is uh, actually an operator that will emit an item only 
if the specified time frame, nothing else happened. Imagine that um, you are typing a search, like on Google. You are typing, for instance, uh, the Politecnico. Ev with an observable, you will have P, PO, POL, POLE. But your, if you are making a network request for any of the elements, you will have to make at least 10 requests before you can actually find whatever you want. If you use this one and you are, uh, well, you are typing faster than one letter uh, at the time you are specifying here, for instance, 300 milliseconds, it will just say, yeah, um, I saw a P, but now I see a PO. Oh, now it's a POL. And if you stop typing, it will just let that pass. So it will work as a filter, timing with the execution of, the, of, of your code. So you will use this one for making, for instance, a lot of requests, while uh, you would use this one when you, when you need to find only something that matches your search and you want the first one. For instance, imagine that you are um, taking um, your data from the network, from the cache, or from the disk. You don't mind which come first, you just want the first. You will use just that. And it's simple. Imagine to do that normally. It will take quite a while. It also, if you have, for instance, five or six sources, it will take a while to code that. With RxJava, you can just combine them and just say, yeah, I want the first one. I don't mind which one it is. So after the first, uh, the filter, we saw the combine and then error handling. Because we can also handle errors with RxJava. And we can do that uh, with all the family or retries. Because for network request, we know that, for instance, it can happen that exactly when we are doing a network request, the network well, went off. So our network failed, and Retrofit is complaining, say, yeah, uh, I couldn't reach the server, so how should I do? Well, with retry, we can say, yeah, try again. You can say, try five more times, or try again when the network comes back. All these are managed by the retry operator. Okay? Or, uh, for instance, imagine that you need to combine, uh, to validate a form, okay? You have username, uh, email, a password. So most probably you aren't really typing them at the same time, right? You type one after the other. But you want to use Eric's Java to validate that form. So you need something that takes all the emission of these three elements and combine them all together, taking the last value of each of them. So you know that which one uh, is not valid. And you will use this one. Because what the combined latest do um, is actually taking the last emission of every observable that is applied to and return your value. So it will shrink them using a function, as we saw for all the other operators. And then return a single one, okay? And the switch works more or less like, like the switch in Java. So we have a lot, few observable, and it will switch based on the condition that we specify. So here we see other two categories that we aren't going to dive deep into, uh, because, well, those are utility methods that you can find everywhere, and this one is the scariest thing about Rx Java, the back pressure. That means that we are pushing the items faster than we can actually consume them. So imagine that we have something that fires events really, really, really fast, but we are not able to parse them. After a while, our, our application will just blow up because, say, I don't know how to handle that. This is exactly what we are handling here. So we have a lot of operators that help us in managing this situation. But usually, we don't have to worry about that. It's good to know it, but it's also very good to avoid it. Because it's not an easy task, and this is why the observable.create is not as good as actually we believed. 
because this operator cannot manage that. He will just say, yeah, do that. He doesn't have any, t any kind of control on, on the back pressure and on the speed the subscriber can actually have. The other operators that we saw can help us. So it's easier if we actually create the observable using just or from than using create. So it's really normal that we find ourselves preferring just from or the others instead of using create. So uh, we talked about uh, net, well, threads and all this stuff, but we didn't really see how to specify to our code how we want the result. So, well, there's a way to do that. And this is the scheduler part. Because we, uh, I told earlier that uh, some operator run on their thread. For instance, thread that uh, do an heavy computation of your data will run on the scheduler that is here. Others just run whatever you tell them to do. I mean, you are on the main thread, they run on the main thread. They don't mind. Other operators specify a scheduler. A scheduler is something, uh, is a thread that has um, a specific duty and it will just um, help the operator using that thread. So you won't have to worry about that. But if you want to specify it, you can because you have something for the computation, something that you can define as you want, something that say, yeah, I don't mind the trading, I want it to execute it right now. And something that is for IO only. But uh, actually IO is an heavy computation, why we have two? Uh, one is because this one has a fixed amount of threads that is equal to the number of cores that you have, and this one is actually backed by a thread pool. So it means that it grows the more you need to work. So if you need a huge amount of data to be written, it will grow. If you need just a small amount of data, it will shrink down. And then we have a new generic thread. I mean, I don't care where to execute it. You're just doing a new thread. And this could be a good idea for a networking request. Or we have the trampoline. This is interesting because it will enqueue your code right behind everything else in the same thread. So once it finishes doing everything, it will just enqueue your code and make it run. And then uh, there is the part that actually was missing from the framework. It was this one. Because in all these, we didn't see how to come back to the main thread. If we try to parse something in the background and then we try to sub in the subscriber to change the value of a text uh, of, the, of a text view, it will crash because only the thread that created the text view can actually affect it. So the only way to do that is to tell them, otherwise they don't know. But well, we saw this, but how actually this relates to what we saw until now? We had two two operators for that, and these the subscribe on and the observe on that are actually the opposite of what you think. Because this one is where you want your code to run. Yeah, I mean, we have a subscriber and the subscribe on, yeah. I mean, they, they are correlated, no, not really. It's the exact opposite. And here is where we say to our code where to return the result. So imagine that we want to, to do, again, a networking request. We will say to our observable, yeah, uh, do that. Um, on a new thread, for instance, but return me the results on the main thread because you need to display them right away. So we saw the different schedulers and also how to manage them. So not only the operators can run on the thread, on a default thread that they are code on, but also we can decide where to run them. And this is very, very useful when we actually want to do some heavy work in the background and return the result easily. And only well, with those stuff, RxJava will be really powerful. Because you so we can do everything we want really easily. But there is another part of RxJava that is actually really interesting. And these are the subjects. 
because we saw that we have observables and subscribers. But there is something that can actually act as both. So something that is like a pipe. And this is kind of useful if you think about that. Because we saw to create an observable and how to subscribe to it. But we didn't see actually how to store the observable. So what happens if we create an observable and then we rotate the activity? Everything gets lost. So imagine a networking request. Yeah, oh, well, it, it's gone. We rotated while we were doing our networking request and we have to redo it. Because it's what happens. We destroy the activity and we recreate it. With this, we actually have an help. We will see that in a moment. Because we have four different kinds of subjects and they have a slightly different behavior. For instance, uh, this one is the easiest because no matter how many times you emit, he will just emit the last one and then complete. No matter where you when you subscribe, you, you see, we are emitting these three items. Uh, we don't care. We just emit to all the subscribers only the last two. Well, the last one, sorry. And then they complete. Uh, then there is the behavior subject. That is pretty much the one that you will use more often together with the next one. Because this one will emit not only the item that you can see, that means that uh, we come in a room and you won't listen only the sentences that I'm saying from now on, but also the last sentence that I was saying. So you have somehow a context of what's happening. And if we see actually the published one, uh, well, we see that it doesn't give us the context. I mean, say, yeah, I arrived at the beginning and I can see uh, all the speech. I arrived 10 minutes ago. Yeah, I can see only the last part. And then there is something that actually tells us everything's happened. So like, uh, you know, what's happened in the previous episode, like, um, you know, if you watch TV series, there's a small recap. This is the replay subject. So no matter when you subscribe, you will see the full list of events emitted by, by the subscriber, by the observable, sorry. So how actually, oops, I skipped the slide. So how actually can we use them? For instance, we can store the subject and use the subject to subscribe to our observable. And then when we recreate the, acti the activity, we just subscribe to the subject and we see the, con the results. So we act as a bridge. So it's pretty hard to manage. I know it took me quite a while to, to process this part, but it's fairly useful because yeah, we know uh, how to create a portrait only or a landscape only app, but we cannot do that really often. So we need techniques that can help us in managing these changes of state. And it's not just the rotation, but it's all the different change of states that we can have. For instance, I don't know, a call or something like that. So with the subjects, we have a weapon more to deal with that. Okay. So now I'll just link a few things that will help you in your everyday life. And there is this book that is pretty easy. And it's uh, from a uh, um, well, an Italian guy, but it's written in English, and it's pretty good for starting because in one hour it's really hard to explain everything about react reactive programming. But this guy can do that in 300 pages, so it's worth a look. Then there are a few libraries that you will use a lot of times. Uh, the first one is what we were talking here. The other one is, uh, well, the one that I use for networking requests because Retrofit is pretty good and it works very well with, with RxJava because it uses a technology that uh, actually uh, make all the things that we create um, implements every interface that we want. It's, it's an, an unknown feature of Java, but it's pretty helpful. So it comes with compatibility with everything we can write. So it's good. And also the version 1.x will run your 
networking request in a separate thread. If you go to the two, uh, well, you will have to do that yourself, but it's pretty easy, you saw that. Otherwise, you will just fire a networking on main thread exception. So if you are using the, the two dot ho, be sure to just call the thread. And then there are those two libraries. Uh, I think that you all know Trello, it is pretty famous software. They wrote this library that is called Rx Lifecycle. That means that um, these guys provide us a small set of hooks that we can use in our activity. That means that instead of uh, extending up compact activity, we will extend Rx up compact activity because they created uh, an observable that will tell us, actually it's not an observable, but well, it will tell us when the different events of our activity or fragments are fired. So we can, for instance, say, yeah, uh, when our activity goes in the on pause, just unsubscribe, and it will do automatically, because you will know when our activity emits the on pause. So that means that instead of just calling super.onPause, we say, yeah, uh, also notify the observables that we are actually going in the on pause. So it's pretty helpful because you won't need to take care of anything because it will do that for you. And then there is also Rx binding from Jake Wharton that works in Square. And he's one of the guys that wrote most of the code from behind Rx Android and one who actually maintains it. And this one is interesting because we saw that we can actually listen to the activity, but we didn't see how to do that with views. So this library will tell us when, for instance, a click happens. So we don't have to call that part ourselves. We just say, yeah, I need something that will tell me when the click happens. So we'll just link the view and it will tell us. It will create an observable for us. And then there is also another one that I didn't link it here because it's pretty hard to, to manage, also for a compiled point of view that is called Retro Lambda. That is a part that I totally avoided here but it's, well, fairly easy to, to use, but it will take some time because, I mean, we saw that we have a lot of anonymous class because every time we create a function or an action, well, Retro Lambda will avoid that. It will, uh, it will have add some syntax sugar and it will all look nicer. Then there are a couple of blogs that are pretty useful. Oops, 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 so. No, I can't use this thing. Okay, so um, this one usually uh, writes a lot of stuff about basic Rx Java, and this one is the guy that works in Trello, so it's the one that takes care of Rx lifecycle. This one uh, explains a lot of stuff on how Rx Java internal work, but I have to admit that it's not that easy because uh, he used often a very specific term and once you get used to Rx Java, it will be interesting to read how it works behind the scenes. But well, this one is much easier to process at the beginning. And also, if you want, there is this one that is in Italian. They have a very, very interesting crash course on, uh, on Rx Java and a couple of screencasting. So feel free to check it because it's very nice. And so that's it. I hope that well, everything was clear. I know that Rx Java is not the easiest part of, well, a, the easiest framework ever, but uh, once you process it, and I hope that you are at least curious about it, well, it will save, save you a lot of days of development. So thank you all. If you don't have any questions, or, well, if you have questions, I'm here. So thank you all for joining. <laughs>